Good evening, church. It's good to see you tonight. Would you stand with me as we begin to worship? We're going to sing with loud voices that Christ is our hope in life and death.
Amen. Amen. Psalm 145. It says, I will extol you, my God and my King, and bless your name forever and ever. Every day I will bless you and praise your name forever and ever. For great is the Lord and greatly to be praised, and his greatness is unsearchable. One generation shall commend your works to another and shall declare your mighty acts. On the glorious splendor of your majesty, and of your wondrous works, I will meditate. They shall speak of the might of your awesome deeds, and I will declare your greatness. 
they shall pour forth the fame of your abundant goodness and shall sing aloud of your righteousness. Would you sing this with us? Worthy of every song we could ever sing. Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. We live for you. Sing his name. Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever say. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Oh, we live for you. Because you're holy. There is no one like you. There is none beside you. Open up my eyes in wonder and show.
Jesus, what a joy to sing tonight that you are our soul's glory, joy, and crown. To sing of the beauty and the power of Jesus. We love you and we worship you. And we pray all of these things in your name. Amen. Now to growing concerns about the deadly coronavirus. This killer pandemic is virtually out of control. Tornadoes touched down in several states over the region. The wildfires raging throughout the state. That's right, more than two. The latest earthquake reportedly originated in the same desert area of California. Turn in your Bibles to Revelation chapter 2, verses 8 to 11. Revelation 2, verses 8 to 11. I've wondered all afternoon who's going to show up in the rain on Valentine's Day. And this is what you look like. We're going to pray for the people having dinner someplace. <laughs> you guys are the ones who love each other enough to come to church on... <laughs> <laughs> on Valentine's Day Sunday. All right. Revelation 2, 8 to 11. We are in the first phase of the book of Revelation. There are seven letters and seven seals and seven trumpets and seven bowls. That's the outline of the book. We're in the seven letters. And the seven letters are very important. Because before we get into the prophecy that is to come, before we get into the return of Jesus Christ and judgment and eternal life and all of the good things that are going to come, uh, we are to judge ourselves according to the standard of Jesus Christ laid out in the seven letters. Jesus doesn't want us to be cocky when we get to the part of the book that talks about his return. He wants us to measure ourselves against who he is and what he's done. And so he gives us that standard in each of the seven letters. Tonight we come to Smyrna. And what, what I'm asking you to do is hold your life up to the light of this word of Christ. Hold our church up to the light of this word of Christ and see how we fare. I know, and you know, that this word to Smyrna is not a word to Smyrna alone for all the reasons that we mentioned last week that I won't repeat, but one that I'll just mention is in verse 11. It says, he who has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So Jesus speaks this first to Smyrna, it has relevance for Smyrna, but then he says to you, as you turn your eyes down into the text of Scripture, it says to you, if you have an ear to hear, you need to hear what he says to 
Ephesus, and you need to hear what he says to Smyrna. So he who has an ear to hear, let him hear. Revelation 2, verses 8 to 11, this is what God says. And to the angel of the church in Smyrna, write, the first and the last who was dead and has come to life says this, I know your tribulation and your poverty, but you are rich. And the blasphemy by those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Do not fear what you are about to suffer. Behold, the devil is about to cast some of you into prison so that you'll be tested and you'll have tribulation for 10 days. Be faithful until death and I will give you the crown of life. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He who overcomes will not be hurt by the second death. Let's pray. Father, we wanna listen. We wanna listen to the words of Jesus Christ as he speaks through Smyrna to First Baptist. We wanna listen to what Jesus says as he speaks through the individuals at Smyrna to each heart in this room and to each person watching and listening online. Father, would you light up our hearts, our minds, our souls, our very lives as we pay attention to what Jesus has to say to us even now, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. As we come to this church, this church in Smyrna, this faithful church in Smyrna that is promised tribulation. We said a couple of weeks ago that it doesn't matter whether you are pre-trib, mid-trib, or post-trib, all of us are guaranteed by Jesus Christ and the Gospel of John to experience tribulation, to experience trials and trouble. We live in a broken and a sinful world, and we have either just gotten done with trials, we are in the middle of trials, or there are trials coming. This is a church that is in the midst of tribulation, and as it is a church that's in the midst of tribulation, it is a statement to us about how faithfulness works in a faithless world. Here's a church that's being faithful in a faithless world, the church in Smyrna in the first century. I want to tell you about one of the leaders of the church in Smyrna shortly after they received this letter. He's a man named Polycarp. Polycarp is one of the most famous and influential Christian leaders of the first and second century. He's known as an early church father and is one of the most influential in church history. Polycarp was discipled by the apostle John the author of Revelation. That is to say, he knew and had a close relationship with John, the beloved disciple, and so he knew somebody who knew Jesus Christ. He was a key and influential figure. And he was appointed the head of the church in Smyrna not long after this letter was written to Smyrna. Smyrna existed under the faithful leadership of their pastor, Polycarp. They existed as a faithful church in hard days in the church as Rome began to persecute the church in Smyrna, and they began in particular to persecute the leader of the church, Polycarp. It was demanded of Polycarp that he render worship to Caesar. In particular, he was in, it was insisted that he burn incense as an act of worship to the Roman Caesar. And Polycarp did what he ought to have done, 
as a faithful minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ. He refused to engage in anyone, in worship of anyone except Jesus Christ. And for his faithfulness, he was executed. He became a martyr, a Christian pastor killed because he would not worship Caesar. He would only worship Jesus Christ. It's a marker of how faithfulness works in a faithless world. In a faithless world, you can be faithful and experience trouble. Polycarp, as he was discipled by the apostle John, would have learned it from his mentor, John the apostle. As John writes this to us, you know that he was writing imprisoned on the island of Patmos, which is where the Roman government placed political prisoners. So Polycarp, a martyr, one who was persecuted for his faith, would have learned about persecution from the Apostle John who writes this letter. And you and I know that the Apostle John would have learned about this from Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the greatest example there is of infinite faithfulness that meets with persecution and death in a faithless world. One of the most obvious evidences, proves that we live in a faithless world is that you can be faithful and get in trouble for it. It happened to Jesus, it happened to his disciple John, and it happened to John's disciple Polycarp, the pastor of the church in Smyrna. It happened to the Christians at Smyrna. And I, wanna, I want us to learn together about what faithfulness in a faithless world looks like as we listen to these words of Jesus Christ. One of the things that's very clear as Jesus speaks to Smyrna and to us through Smyrna is that Smyrna is a church that is enduring hardship. They're in the midst of suffering and pain. Revelation chapter 2 Verse 9, Jesus says, I know your tribulation. Right now, you're in trouble. This, you remember the vision of Jesus with the eyes that are aflame, and he sees, he searches, he knows everything, and he sees the suffering, the hardship, the pain, the tribulation of his people in Smyrna. He says, I know your tribulation and your poverty. He says in verse 10, don't fear what you are about to suffer. There's trouble in Smyrna. There's hardship. There's suffering. There's tribulation. There is poverty. And all of that because of their faithfulness in following Jesus Christ. We see in Smyrna hardship that they have experienced in the past. And we see Jesus Christ promise to this faithful church hardship that they're getting ready to experience in the future. You see the hardship in the past in verse 9, we read that he knows their tribulation and their poverty. This is a church that for whatever reason, it's not made clear to us in the text, but for whatever reason, their faithfulness in Christ has led them to suffer economic loss. As they gave faithful testimony to Jesus, their employers were not pleased with them. The word got out on the street that you don't need to frequent the businesses of those weirdo Christians. They were suffering economic loss because of their poverty. It was not an uncommon thing in, uh, in the early church. In Hebrews chapter 10, verse 34, one of the commendations to the Hebrews is that you showed sympathy to the prisoners and accepted joyfully the seizure of your property, knowing that you have for yourselves a better possession and a lasting one. There was, at least it wasn't unheard of in the early church to begin to be faithful to Jesus and to have that faithfulness result in lost financial opportunity. So they had, they'd experienced impoverishment. Also because of their faithfulness, it led to slander. The text says, I know your tribulation and your poverty, but you are rich. And the blasphemy of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Now, this, this requires some, some explanation. First of all, uh, 
the, the word here is blasphemy. And that, that is the actual word that is used here. But blasphemy can mean two things. It can mean uh, sinful speech against God when the context is God, or it can mean sinful speech against other people when the context is people. It's pretty clear here that the people being spoken ill of are not God, but the Christians at Smyrna. So, so really, if you, uh, you want to know what this means, uh, it's not so much the word we use as blasphemy, but it's the word we use as slander. A lot of your translations will have it in there like that. Um, the point is, they are being spoken about in a really negative and in a really bad way. And they're being spoken ill of by the Jews. At this point in history, the Jews are unhappy with Christians. And Jews would have been in a unique ability to make life difficult for the Christians because Jews were a recognized religion by the Roman government. One of the reasons that Christianity was able to excel and grow unencumbered in the early decades after the resurrection of Jesus Christ is because Christianity was viewed as a subset of Judaism. Well, what seems to be happening at this point in history is the Jews are complaining to the Roman government that those guys aren't really Jews, they're something else. And so they are participating in making life difficult for the Christians. Bad things are being said about them. And, and something happens here. These words from Jesus Christ are in the context, if you just think about the whole Bible from Genesis to Revelation, there is something shocking here that is out of left field from the standpoint of redemptive history. It says the blasphemy by those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Jesus Christ looks at Jewish people meeting in the synagogue and he says, those people in that synagogue, they're not even Jews. It's a gathering. Synagogue means gathering. It's a gathering, all right. But it's not a gathering of my people, Jesus says. It's a gathering of people who follow Satan. Now, you think about the Old Testament and how shocking this is. That the Jews are the chosen people of God. They are a holy nation, a royal priesthood. God has set them apart. They are his people. But by the time you get to the New Testament, we start to see some things changing. If you uh, look back at the Gospel of John, in John chapter 8, verse 44, Jesus is having a back and forth with the Jewish leaders. They're upset with him, and he's not real pleased with them. And he says to them, you are of your father, the devil, and you want to do the desires of your father. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. Whenever he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own nature, for he is a liar and the father of lies. And Jesus says, you're just like your dad. You are just like your dad, the devil. That's Jesus Christ, the Son of God, saying to Jewish people, you are of your father, the devil. Same sort of thing happens in Romans chapter 2, verses 28 to 29, for he is not a Jew who is one outwardly, nor is circumcision that which is outward in the flesh. But he is a Jew who is one inwardly, and circumcision is that which is of the heart by the spirit, not by the letter, and his praise is not from men, but from God. You want to know who a Jew is? The apostle Paul says, doesn't have anything to do with your birthright. It doesn't have anything to do with your ethnicity. It has to do with your heart. Jesus says, you say you're Jews and you're not. You're a synagogue of Satan. Is this anti-Semitic? People have used this in history to say some very, and do some very anti-Semitic things. 
But this is not anti-Semitism. This is in the New Testament, with the coming of Christ, everything about you that matters has to do with what you do with Jesus. God is not forming his people outwardly and ethnically anymore. You are no longer God's people merely by being born into the right lineage. You are a child of God, not because of your ethnicity, but because of your faith in Jesus Christ. And if you don't have faith in Jesus Christ, you are not a child of God, whether you're a Jew or not. You are a child of God or you are a child of Satan based on what you think of Jesus. And it doesn't matter if you're of Israel. Their faithfulness of these Christians has led to slander by people. And Jesus is saying, God the Son, the Holy One of Israel is saying, I don't care if you're born into Israel. If you reject me, you're a gathering of Satan and you're opposed to my people who love me and I am opposed to you. It's a very sobering reality. This is the hardship they're experiencing in the past. They've lost some money. They've lost some credibility. They're being slandered. Jesus doesn't stop there. He promises hardship in the future. He says that their faithfulness is going to lead to imprisonment. In verse 10, he says, don't fear what you're about to suffer. So you've had some suffering. You've had some tribulation. Guess what? There's more coming. Don't be afraid about that. Behold, the devil is about to cast some of you into prison. You're being faithful, you're following me, you're not a part of the synagogue of Satan, you love Jesus, you're trusting him, you're having your hope and your confidence in him, and things aren't gonna be fun for a little while. You are going to go to jail as a result of your imprisonment. It's not gonna stop there, there's worse things coming than that. Verse 10 goes on. He's about to cast some of you into prison so that you'll be tested and you'll have tribulation for 10 days. Be faithful until death. Some of you are going to go to prison because you're being faithful and you're never getting out. You're going to be persecuted in jail and you are going to die. That's what's coming for some of you. Jesus says to the people in Smyrna and Jesus says to us, through the people of Smyrna. Your faithfulness is going to lead to imprisonment and death. This is what it means to be faithful in a faithless world. When you are faithful, this is, this is a rule throughout this life. It's a Rule that began with the life and ministry of Jesus, and it's a rule that continues till today. When you are faithful to Jesus, there will be people who want to harm you. That's just the truth. And, and it is, a, and you say, why? Why would that be? And it's because we have a Christianity that's more like the health and wealth gospel than it is like the real gospel with a crucified Savior. We, what Jesus is doing here is disabusing us of the notion that if we are just faithful, we're going to be rich and powerful and big and happy all the time. And Jesus is saying that's not true. The, the Christian life isn't your best life now. Lord, I hope not. The truth of the matter is that when you are faithful, people will want to harm you. This makes us slow to judge when we see Christians going through a hard time. You ever know somebody that wants to judge somebody going through a hard time? Well, they must not be living right. What are, what are they up to? My goodness, what's the Lord doing to them? Well, they might be guilty of living faithfully in a fallen world. In this crazy, mixed up, sinful world, a lot of times when you're faithful, people can't rest until they destroy you. Smyrna 
as a church enduring hardship. That's not the only thing Jesus says about Smyrna. Smyrna, in the midst of hardship, is actually a really healthy church. That's the point. In the midst of their hardship, in the midst of their suffering and poverty and tribulation, things are actually going really well from an eternal perspective. As a matter of fact, as we look at these seven churches over the next few weeks, for most churches, Jesus has both encouragement and correction. He has good things to say, and he has bad things to say. There are two churches that Jesus has nothing bad to say about. There are two churches where Jesus only says good things. One of the churches is the church at Philadelphia. The other church is the church at Smyrna. This is one of the two churches where Jesus gives no condemnation. He gives no correction. He only has good things to say. The point is that even though Smyrna is hurting, they are very healthy. This is not the way we think, right? We think when it's hard, things are bad. We're going through a tough time. It must be disastrous in the church. It's got to be caving in, right? Well, Jesus says, I know your tribulation and your poverty, but you are rich. He said, look, I know it's hard, but you're rich. What this means is, the the way this is not nonsense is Jesus is saying there's a whole other way you have to evaluate how things are going in your church. If the evaluation is things on the outside have to look big and rich, well, you're going to be confused. But Jesus says, no, that's not the way it is. Jesus says, you can be suffering, you can be poor, you can be going through tribulation and hardship, and things can actually be really good. You can be wealthy because there's a whole other way to evaluate how your church is doing. Even though Smyrna is hurting, they're healthy, they're rich. And there are two reasons, at least, why that can be true. The first reason is that the presence of suffering without sin is good. It's good for you to experience suffering as long as you're not guilty of sin. In 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 20, the apostle Peter says, what credit is there if when you sin and are harshly treated? you endure it with patience. So if you do something bad and you suffer for it and you make it through patiently, what good is that? But if when you do what is right and suffer for it, you patiently endure it, this finds favor with God. God is happy when he looks down at a person or a church who is experiencing difficulty and it's through no fault of their own, but they are patient and they trust God, that thrills the Lord. What do you want? You want everybody in the world happy with you or do you want God happy with you? You're rich when even when you're going through a hardship, God is happy with you. You know, another passage like this is in Matthew chapter five, verses 10 to 12. We looked at this a long time ago as we're going through the Gospel of Matthew on Sunday mornings. Blessed are those who have been persecuted for the sake of righteousness. If you're persecuted because you're a sinner, well, this doesn't apply to you. But blessed are those who've been persecuted for the sake of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you. They make fun of you. They rip you. Blessed are you when people insult you, when they persecute you, when they actually mistreat you, when they do things to you to harm you, and when they falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me, when they lie about you. They're mean to you, they're cruel and and do things to mistreat you, and they lie about you. When this happens to us, when this happens to me, we freak out. We rend our garments and throw dust in the air and freak out. Jesus turns the tables on us. He says, you're blessed when that happens. Why? Verse 12, rejoice and be glad for your reward is great in heaven. 
You're rich because you're storing up treasures in heaven. Every bad thing they say, every false accusation they make, every insult is another jewel in your crown in heaven. It's hard, but you're rich. That's what Jesus says. So you can be rich even when it's hard because suffering without sin is a real good thing. And another reason is that God uses suffering to do good things in your life, to do good things in your life right now. In Romans chapter 5, verses 3 to 5, the Bible says not only this, but we also exult in our tribulations. We, We are overjoyed. We flip out in a good way. When we experience tribulations, knowing that tribulation brings about perseverance. You got to make it through. You got to stick with it. It doesn't take any particular grace to stick with Jesus, to stick with God, to stick with church, to stick with Christianity when things are easy. It takes perseverance to stick with it when things are hard. One of the first pastors that I had said, Christianity takes stick to I don't know if that's a real word or not, but he said it all the time. It takes perseverance to stick with it when it's hard. So you rejoice when things are hard. Why? Because suffering's fun? No, because it produces perseverance. And perseverance produces proven character. There is a proving that is happening in all of our suffering. There is a testing that is taking place to determine what we are really made of. Do we really believe all this stuff we say about Jesus taking care of us? Do we really believe all this stuff that we say about Jesus is enough? We sing Christ is enough for me. We sing that Jesus is our glory. Do we really mean that? It takes some heat from suffering to prove what we're made of. And on the other side of suffering, on the other side of tribulation, on the other side of slander and insults and persecution, there is a proven character that is standing there on the other side. And verse four says, and proven character, hope. Hope is that heavenly possession that is ours, but that we don't have yet. The the proving that happens in suffering that shows what we're made of, that shows we're really Christians, is what gives us hope that the inheritance is really ours. And so God is doing good things in the suffering. He's doing good things in the trouble and in the pain and the persecution that he wouldn't do without it. Verse 5 says, hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. And so in Smyrna, you can be rich from a heavenly perspective, even when you're poor from an earthly perspective, because the presence of suffering without sin is a really good thing. And because God uses suffering for good purposes in our lives. The point is that the presence of pain, the presence of suffering is not at odds with health. That's the message of Jesus to his faithful church in Smyrna. But the presence of hardship isn't easy. And so we need hope. And that's the last thing I want to say about Smyrna tonight. There is hope for a healthy church enduring hardship. We see that in Smyrna. There's hope from Christ who speaks to the church. At the beginning of every one of these letters, The author of the letter is identified, and the author of the letter is always Jesus, but he is always identified in a little bit of a different way. He's always identified in some way that connects him with how he was talked about in Revelation 1, and in some way that makes how he was talked about in Revelation 1 relevant for that church. We see it in Revelation chapter 2, verse 8. He says, "...into the angel of the church in Smyrna write the first and the last." That's Jesus, the one who's writing to you. This church in hardship, this church in trouble, this church in turmoil. I am the first 
and the last, Jesus says. He said this of himself in Revelation chapter 1, verse 17. When I saw him, John said, I fell at his feet like a dead man, and he placed his right hand on me, saying, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. Jesus wants to remind Smyrna, he wants to remind this church in hardship that he's the beginning and the end. There's nothing before him, there's nothing after him, and he contains everything in between. The point is there is nothing going on in your life that I'm not in control of. There's no hardship you're experiencing that's outside my control. I have it covered. And he doesn't stop there. He says, I'm the first and the last who is dead and has come to life. If you want to be encouraged when things are hard, if you want to be encouraged when you're facing your own death, I don't know about you, but I can't imagine a better person to encourage you than one who has experienced death and come out on the other side of it alive. Jesus Christ as the resurrected King and Savior is the proof that when you are a Christian, when you are trusting in Christ, death never ends in death. When you're a Christian, when you're trusting in Christ, death always ends in life. It's crazy. (laughs) It's actually a really insane thing to say, but it's true. That's what Jesus comes to do. He He comes to turn death upside down. So that when you trust in him, your death doesn't end in your death, but it ends in your life. And Jesus' resurrection is the proof. So the one who is the first and the last, the one who used to be dead, but is breathing right now, wants to speak to you and give you some hope and encouragement. There's this hope from this Christ who speaks to the churches. There's hope from Christ who knows how long the suffering is is going to last. Verse 10 says, don't fear what you're about to suffer. Come on, Jesus, really? Don't fear? You're promising prison and death, and you're saying don't fear it? That's what he says. Don't fear what you're about to suffer. Behold, the devil is about to cast some of you into prison so that you'll be tested, and you will have tribulation for 10 days. Numbers in Revelation are tricky. Um, you can't always assume that they are literal. One of the things we saw from a couple of weeks ago is one of the main ways that uh, the revelation is communicated to us is in symbols. I don't think that the number 10 here is literally 10 24-hour periods. It's just a definite period of time. Jesus is saying that there is a very definite, very limited period of time to your suffering. I, who am the first and the last, have ordained how long that is going to last, and it is not going to last one second longer than it is supposed to. It's the same idea that we read about in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 10. It says, after you have suffered a little while. Oh, isn't that great? After you've suffered a little while. The God of all grace, who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself perfect, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. The Bible teaches that suffering is coming. Tribulation is coming. It is real. It is painful. It is bad. But it just lasts a little while. It just lasts a little while, and then God himself will lift the suffering and you'll be confirmed, perfected, established. And the way Jesus talks about that in Revelation is he talks about rewarding those churches and those people who are faithful. He says, be faithful until death, and I'll give you the crown of life. He says in verse 10, he who has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He who overcomes will not be hurt by the second death. This is one of the places in the Bible where we hear that there is a first death and there is a second death. The first death is the death talked about in uh, Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27, where it says it's appointed man wants to die, and after that comes the judgment. All of us have so many breaths, we have so many heartbeats, and one day we will breathe our last and our eyes will close in death and they will open on the other side of eternity and Jesus Christ will be there. And there will be 
an immediate judgment of our life. We will either be accepted and forgiven based on our trust in Jesus Christ, or we will be rejected and condemned based on our rejection of Jesus Christ. That's the first death. But then there is the second death. This is the final judgment at the last day, at the return of Jesus Christ. It's talked about a few times in Revelation. In Revelation chapter 20, verse 6, we're fast forwarding to the end here for just a second. It says, blessed and holy is the one who has a part in the first resurrection. Over these, the second death has no power, but they will be priests of God and of Christ and will reign with him for a thousand years. In verse 14, It says, then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. Chapter 21, verse 8, it says, but for the cowardly and unbelieving and abominable and murders and immoral persons and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars, their part will be in the lake that burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. There is a great and final judgment coming at the end for everybody. Jesus talks about this in Matthew 25 with the separation of the sheep and the goats. That will be the second death when those who have not trusted in Jesus Christ will be consigned to eternal hell. That is the second death. And Jesus says, if you overcome, if you're faithful for 10 days, for just a little while, Some of you are going to jail, some of you are gonna die, but you won't be hurt by the second death. But you'll escape, you'll get a crown of life. Verse 10 says, be faithful unto death and I'll give you the crown of life. James chapter one, verse 12 says, blessed is a man who perseveres under trial for once he's been approved, he will receive the crown of life which the Lord has promised to those who love him. I mentioned Polycarp, he was martyred for being faithful. I want you to listen to how he died. Polycarp had been asked to say, Caesar is Lord, but he refused. Brought to the stadium, the proconsul urged him saying, swear and I will set thee at liberty, reproach Christ. Polycarp answered, 80 and six years have I served him, and he never did me any injury. How then can I blaspheme my king and my savior? When the proconsul again pressed him, the old man answered, since thou art vainly urgent, that I should swear by the fortune of Caesar and pretendest not to know who and what I am, hear me declare with boldness, I am a Christian. A little later, the proconsul answered, I have wild beasts at hand. To these will I cast thee, except thou repent. But Polycarp said, thou threatenest me with fire, which burneth for an hour and after a little is extinguished, but art ignorant of the fire of the coming judgment and of eternal punishment reserved for the ungodly. But why tarriest thou? Bring forth what thou wilt. Soon afterwards, the people began to gather wood and kindling, the Jews especially according to custom, eagerly assisting them. Thus Polycarp was burned at the stake, but the fire wasn't hot enough. It didn't consume his body, it only melted his flesh. And when the fire was extinguished, he laid there choking and writhing, and they had to stab him to death with a spear. Thus ended the life of a faithful pastor. But it was okay, he was faithful. And as soon as he closed his eyes in death, Jesus was there. And he was safe forever. Listen, everybody has to die once. But by faith in Jesus Christ, you don't have to die twice. When you die once, it's for a moment and then glory forever. 
when you die twice, it's forever and pain into everlasting. Jesus speaks to Smyrna and he speaks to us. He calls us faithfully to trust him. And he says, if you're faithful for just a little while, this faithless world is gonna give way to a lifetime and eternity of infinite glory that will never fade. And you'll be with me forever. You'll have the crown of life. Let's stand and let's pray. Father, I pray that everybody within the sound of my voice would be protected from the second death by trusting in Jesus Christ. I pray that we would resolve to be faithful in the midst of pain, faithful in a faithless world, and trust you until our eyes behold you forever and ever and ever. Help us to rejoice and delight in the great hope of having a crown of life that you will give to us yourself. Thank you for providing it for us. We thank you in Jesus' name, amen.